When the smoke cleared and the fighting was over, World War I was the deadliest war in human history, with a staggering 10 million military personnel and 7 million civilians dead. Two decades later, World War II would top this figure, with between 70 and 85 million people killed. World War II alone would kill off 3% of the world's population. But with some of the largest and bloodiest battles in history, you might wonder what happened after the battle to all those dead soldiers and civilians. Disposing of the dead is a vital military task for many reasons. Chief amongst them though is the hygienic and morale concerns. Dead bodies littering a battlefield will very quickly lead to outbreaks of disease and illness, and a high enough concentration of dead bodies can even poison local water supplies if a battle took place in the wrong area. With disease being as big a killer in most wars as enemy action, the world very quickly learned that there needed to be an efficient and quick way to dispose of the bodies after combat, or risk the health of the survivors and local communities. Another major concern though is the effect that casualties have on overall morale. After all, nobody wants to move through a battlefield to get to the new front lines and be greeted by the grisly remains of hundreds or even thousands of soldiers who came before you and died. During the Allied invasion of Normandy in World War II, the removal of battlefield casualties from the landing beaches became a matter of paramount importance. Men were dispatched to clean up the beaches of both Allied and German corpses, sometimes even having to dive under the water to cut bodies free from the overturned landing craft. It was a grisly business, but one that was vitally necessary in order to protect the morale of troops landing in subsequent waves. In the past, the removal of battlefield casualties was largely left up to local villagers, and if there was time and resources, perhaps some military units. In World War I, individual units were largely responsible for seeing to their own dead, and fellow soldiers would search the battlefield for corpses and deliver them for burial in mass graves. Often military units would enlist the aid of local villagers to help sort the battlefield for casualties, and the dead of both sides were buried with all their comrades albeit in different mass graves for the two opposing armies. Usually after a large battle, a local ceasefire would be negotiated, allowing both sides to send men out to recover their dead. When the situation allowed, the men would be buried in individual graves, but typically mass graves were the simplest and therefore preferred option. The location of the graves would be recorded and later when time allowed or perhaps after the war, bodies would be exhumed and then given proper burials. Things improved during World War II somewhat, and more emphasis was placed on proper burials when possible for both enemy and friendly dead. The responsibility still lay with individual units, but both sides had military graves officers whose specific job was burying the dead. The Germans dictated that mass graves were the preferred option for burial, and that these graves should be located near railway lines if possible. The burial site should also include pathways so that after the war it could be turned into a proper military cemetery. However, as the war raged on, the practice became unfeasible, and mass graves were dug where they could be conveniently located. Local ceasefires were still commonplace after major battles so that both sides could recover their dead. The Allies also left the responsibility of burying their dead largely in the hands of the individual units, who would comb a battlefield after the fight and gather corpses for burial. The Americans, though, had a unit known as the Quartermaster Graves Registration Service, or GRS, who was tasked with the proper burial of American dead, and the incredible lengths to which these men went to ensure the recovery and burial of their dead was nothing short of heroic. A much greater emphasis was placed on proper burial rites for individuals based on their religion, and as often as possible the dead were buried in individual and proper graves, instead of mass graves. The GRS units would not just bury American casualties, but any allied casualty they came across, even Axis soldiers and civilians killed in the crossfire. They would often hire local villagers to help with the task, and even used POWs to help dig graves who were often terrified, believing that they were digging their own graves. The GRS units were well known to go to extraordinary lengths not only to recover bodies, but to identify them and give them proper burials according to the Fallen's religious affiliation. The graves would be well marked and the location passed along to relevant authorities, with many of the graves exhumed after the war and the bodies moved to proper military cemeteries across Europe. Identifying the dead could be grisly business, especially given the efficacy of modern weapons. Often inside a burned out tank all that could be discovered was molten rings and other jewelry and teeth. If the GRS men were lucky, they may find a dog tag intact. Crawling into crashed airplanes though could lead to the discovery of many dead, most of them dismembered and almost impossible to identify. Still, the GRS soldiers diligently worked to pry loose human remains and have them identified any way possible. 
Dog tags were the primary way of identifying a soldier, but if those were missing, then the men would take prints of all ten fingers and prepare a dental chart for identification. If the body was in really bad shape though, a special fluid could be injected into the fingers to allow them to get usable prints, and in severe cases the men would cut the skin off the tips of the fingers directly. Each soldier's uniform also bore laundry marks, which bore the first letter of the last name and the last four digits of their service number. Where once looting of personal effects prevailed, the men of the GRS went to great lengths to protect the personal effects of the dead. Things such as wallets, rings, watches, and photos were all shipped to the Quartermaster's Depot in Kansas City, Missouri, and there they would be cleaned and sent to the next of kin. Blood-stained items and things that could be embarrassing to the family were destroyed on the battlefield, while perishable items such as rations, chewing gum, and cigarettes were distributed amongst the troops. Weapons and ammunition were also gathered up and given to soldiers in need. The GRS men may not have been proper infantry, but that doesn't mean that they operated safely behind friendly lines. In fact, GRS soldiers were amongst the first to land in France during the D-Day invasion, with some of them aboard the gliders that delivered airborne infantry troops behind enemy lines. Their task was grim but necessary, as they were to see to the burial of expected losses amongst the first Allied forces to land in Europe. On the beaches of Normandy, GRS men cut casualties out of landing craft and retrieved their soggy and bloated bodies from the surf. As the war moved east, GRS soldiers followed the front lines, and when winter arrived, their job became that much harder. The snow and ice froze corpses in place, and the men brought bodies into heated morgue tents in order to defrost the bodies enough to allow the recovery of personal effects and to prepare for proper burials. When the offensive crossed into Germany, the Allied casualties were shipped hundreds of miles back to be buried in France, the Netherlands, or Belgium with the GRS men believing that no family back home would want their dead son to be buried in Germany. At the end of World War II, when everybody else got to go home, the GRS soldiers stayed behind, going back over the battlefields of Europe, looking for hastily dug graves that had been overlooked. In just the European theater alone, bodies were scattered over one and a half million miles of territory, and in the Pacific, the bodies of dead American soldiers were spread out across innumerable jungle islands. The GRS men nonetheless diligently scoured both theaters of war for the dead, and in 1946 the government authorized the return of the bodies at the government's expense for proper burial at home. This program would eventually cost $191 million, but that would allow for the families of 170,000 fallen soldiers to bury their loved ones in home burial plots inside the U.S. The recovery of the dead after a major battle is a gruesome yet necessary affair. The existence of units like the Graves Registration Service and the incredible lengths they went to in order to ensure the recovery and proper burial of so many dead soldiers, however, speaks to a strange dichotomy of human nature. On one hand, we invest millions of dollars into weapons that allow us to take life with greater and greater efficacy, and on the other hand, we also spend millions on the recovery of the dead in order to honor the life they once had. If aliens ever arrived on Earth, they'd probably think we were crazy, and we'd be hard-pressed to dispute it. If you've had to serve in one of the world wars, would you rather have been an infantry soldier or a graves registration service soldier? Think you would have had the stomach to handle thousands of dead bodies? Let us know in the comments. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more great content.